Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Lincoln Center Outdoor Series here at Lincoln Center here in New York City. R&B and soul icon Lenny Williams is making a rare appearance here in New York City tonight on the stage and he's going to be performing selections off his brand new record Still in the Game and this album is really a myriad of all the musical genres that Mr. Williams really 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 admires and loves. There's soul, there's southern soul slash blues, there's some smooth jazz and there's a contemporary twist of R&B on this new album. I sat down with the legendary icon earlier this afternoon and talked about the new record. We talked about him growing up in Oakland, California in his days with the Tower of Power. And we also talked about how he's been able to stay in the game and keep on doing what he's been doing for the last 40 years. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of the legendary Mr. Lenny Williams live here at the Lincoln Center Outdoor Series here at Lincoln Center here in New York City. Still in the game, still in the game, yeah, ain't, ain't gave up yet. <laughs> this is a beautiful album, and what I really like about this disc is that you're doing about three things. You've got a little smooth jazz, you've got a little southern soul on this album, and you also got a lot of contemporary R&B on this. Yeah, we worked really hard on this uh, CD. It took us about, maybe about a year, uh, and that was because I was on the road a lot, and uh, so I'd come home and I'd work, and then I'd leave, and so we were just kind of worried about the continuity of the album, making sure that you know that uh, when we came back, that we would uh, still be you know kind of like where we left off. And uh, so once we got it all finished, we had about 18, 19 songs, and then we kind of whittled it down to 12, and I think we uh, you know captured what we were uh, what we set out to do. I mean, there's a song on here that remotely sounds like a little bit of our, uh, Al Green. 
Yeah, well, you know, Al Green is, uh, you know, somebody I listen to. You know, we're both from Arkansas, so uh, quite naturally we had a lot of the same influences. And so, uh, you know, most definitely uh, we could, uh, you know, I could sound like Al, and I, I, I don't think Al would ever sound like me, but, uh, yo, he's the man for sure. But uh, most definitely uh, uh, I'm sure I came up with some of the same influences that Al uh, had, yeah. And there's a special guest on here, Mr. Kirk Whalum. Oh, that's the man, uh, Kirk Whalum. I, uh, I did a gig with him years ago, and so I thought, thought well, you know, we're going to have a saxophone player on the gig, and then he starts singing. Kirk Whalum, a uh, singer, singer under the ground. Oh, yeah, you, if you're singing and you're on the gig with Kirk Whalum, you better do your voice exercise because Kirk Whalum can sing, but uh, most definitely he played uh, some beautiful sax on the uh, song Him and I and uh, Derek Allen. Uh, we uh, wrote the song and uh, published it, and... Uh, so uh, it's just an honor to uh, to be on a on a record with him. I was on the uh, Tom Jarner cruise, and I got a chance to see him. And I was like, hey, Kurt, I sure would like to have you, uh, you know, uh, be on my CD. And uh, you know, he uh, uh, said right away that he would do it, and I just really appreciate him for it so much. Yeah. You know, this record really is a reflection of where you are musically, and I just want to know how you've been able to stay with the times because your voice is so pure and you really are of the old school and you're bringing a whole nother swag to to the music on this album. Well, I think that part of it is just making a commitment to, to stay. That's like, I ain't going nowhere. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's like a, maybe like your neighborhood might be changing or, you know, or you know, you going to school and, and uh, you know, everybody went to the next grade and you still there and, and then, uh, you know, you got a whole new crop of people coming in and, you know, it's like, uh, well, you got to get out. The no, I ain't getting out the way, you know, I'm, I'm here, you know. So basically my thing is I, I'm planning to stay in the music business until, you know, I take my last breath. And so I uh, just, you know, have to change with the times, you know. Um, I, I get influenced by a lot of the young artists, you know. I listen to them and, uh, you know, they're definitely some uh, instrumental influences, some vocal influences. I go and watch the shows, you know, try to steal a few little steps and things like that. Yeah, so, and then also I've just been inspired by young people. I have my own uh, CD now and my own record company. And, uh, you know, when I was coming up, that was just something that we just didn't do. And, uh, I mean, Sam Cooke did it, and then after that, it just seemed like nobody really did it. Barry Gordy, uh, uh, you know, the gentleman down in uh, Texas, like Mr. Roby, you know, but not too many people did it. And, uh, you know, these youngsters, uh, you know, everybody got their own label and stuff like that, and so uh, they inspired me to do that. So, you know, just uh, I'm here and uh, intend to, you know, stay here until the good Lord called me.
Rock, Arkansas, but you're home and you grew up in Oakland and I understand that you started off playing trumpet, but you kind of segued and got into the, the voice bug. Yeah, I started off playing trumpet in, uh, in the fourth grade and uh, fell in love with the trumpet, played fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and a little bit of the eighth grade, and then I uh, started singing, and, uh, you know, singing just became just a, a part of me. And then uh, for a while, I was a teenage preacher, and uh, I preached from uh, maybe like uh, from 17 to about 20, and then I was going to college, and I met Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and uh, I was walking across campus one day, and Huey saw me, hey, brother, where you going with that Bible? And I was like, we started talking, and uh, Huey's dad was a preacher, and he asked me if I ever read a book by Franz Fanon called Wretched of the Earth, and then I was like, no. And so, uh, you know, started, uh, you know, getting into all the politics and things of that time period. Um, but, uh, yeah, trumpet was, uh, was my first uh, instrument. I actually started back practicing trumpet about a month ago, so y'all look out. I might have me an a instrumental album coming up in a couple of years from now, yeah, once I get, the, get my chops back. You know, Lenny, Oakland slash San Francisco has always been a very cultural, academic, spiritual, as well as a musical hub. What is it about that music scene that, because you came up at a real great time in the 60s and 70s, what, what is it about that city or those cities that have given the world its nucleus for music? Well, you know, I often wondered that, and then um, I read somewhere that Oakland was had more middle class uh, African Americans than any other city. Now I always thought, well, it, it must be D.C. or it must be Atlanta. But uh, what happened was that Oakland had an army base, had a navy base. It had uh, there was an air force base not too far away. We had the port, and so as a consequence, Oakland, and San Francisco, that area, right? You know, San Francisco had Treasure Island, another navy base. So we had two navy bases. We had uh, an army base, uh, and uh, so you had uh, uh, all kinds of people coming into the city of uh, you know, uh, soldiers and sailors from all over the country coming in and a lot of them stayed so they would bring their own musical taste so you had country music coming in we were close to Mexico so we had the Latino influence uh, San Francisco's got a lot of culture so we had opera and then Oakland had the blues uh, you know we had 7th Street BB King Bobby Blue Bland you name it all of them came through there uh, 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 just you, you just name it, all, all the different guys came to there, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and so as a consequence you had all this kind of music, so if you grew up there, that you, know, you had all the influences there. We, we had Southerners that coming through, so we had the, you know, uh, you know Southern sound of uh, country music coming through there, and so, um, so if you grew up in Oakland, San Francisco, any of those surrounding areas, uh, the radio, uh, that's what the radio was playing and that's what you learned in school. You know, so it was um, just a great, great uh, area to grow up in. I grew up, I went to church with the, with the Hawkins family, the Stewart family, which is Sly Stone and his family, Odia Coates that sang Having My Baby with Paul Anka. We used to go out and hang out in San Francisco with uh, Carlos Santana. You know, so it was just, uh, just an amazing place to, to grow up in, yeah, for sure. She walked in the club, real short skirt, long cut blouse, perfume smelling real loud, red lipstick, long, long, long fingernails. She got on the dance floor, started shaking her tail. We started to dance, she invited me to her place. Soon as we got there, she started kissing my face. Now I'm just a man.
church was really the beginnings of where you got your training and who were some of your musical influences both on the gospel side as well as the the, the R&B and soul side well most definitely Sam Cooke was a, one of my greatest influences you know Sam was young he was good looking he was an expert businessman and uh, you know so I just uh, you know he uh, went from uh, gospel to R&B and then he crossed over to pop you know he just you know he just did it all and so he was just somebody that you could look up to you know and somebody that you could aspire to, to be like and so Sam Cooke was one of my greatest influences but you know I loved Curtis Mayfield as uh, I loved all the you know the quartet singing I used to love the, you know from the come to church they all had on those suits and you know they was like real men uh, you know you had to hold on to your girlfriend when the when the quartet singers came through you know so uh, you know so all of those I might even like the, the the female groups like the caravans the ward singers all of those people influenced me Coming from that gospel base, when did you, in your psyche, know that you wanted to pursue the vocal seriously? Because, I mean, you came out at a time when the falsetto and the tenors were raining the airwaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it was... Uh I think what happened was um, around the time that I started going to college and hanging out with Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, I uh, kind of gave up the idea of being a minister because I felt like, wow, you know... Uh, you know, uh, all the people that are against, you know, black people at that time, you know, they were all professing Christianity. I mean, the, the, the symbol of uh, the Ku Klux Klan was the cross, you know. So I was uh, going through some things. So I said, well, I'm going to give it up. Uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of that. And But yet, deep down inside, I couldn't let it all go because I felt like, well, God gave me this gift, you know, which I was using, you know, to preach with. And I did some singing in church, too. And I said, well... Since uh, I'm not going to be using my voice to preach, I'm going to use it to sing so God won't take my gift from me, right? So then I just started, uh, I just made a, a cerebral choice to, uh, to be a singer to, so that I could uh, keep the gift. So that kind of let me know that I really didn't really turn my back on Christianity because I still felt like that uh, it was something that, uh, you know, could affect my life and that uh, you know, I wanted to respect God for the gift. And so I just started, uh, started singing and then I went to a couple of talent shows and uh, somebody said, you want to make a record? I'm like, hell yeah. And so then, uh, you know, I just went on from there. Yeah. understand is your notoriety came when you joined the Tower of Power but you started off as a solo artist before you joined the Tower of Power yeah I was a solo artist I was over on fantasy records uh, with uh, John Fogarty and uh, Huey Lewis and them. they had a group Huey Lewis had a group called the uh, the Golly Gollywogs and uh, so I was over there we were all trying to you know make it happen and then uh, I started hanging out with uh, Larry Graham uh, actually we were living together and uh, and we were writing songs, and uh, 
Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we decided we wanted to put some horns on some stuff and, uh, you know, met the guys from uh, Town Power. And then I started writing for them, actually, uh, on, uh, you know, their albums. And then eventually I became the lead singer of that band and then, uh, you know, uh, left there after uh, two years and uh, three uh, great albums. And, uh, you know, just uh, started doing my own thing, did something over at Motown. Actually, I did the song Cause I Love You over there, which it really didn't, that song, I didn't have the talking in it and it was a little faster. And so then I left there and went to ABC. C Records uh, did an album over there, Choosing You, and that album sold uh, 480,000 copies. Then I came back with the Spark of Love record and uh, put Cost I Love You on there, slowed it down, put the talking in there. Uh, Andre Couch came to the studio the day him and his sister Sandra, his twin sister, the day I was singing it. I said, oh, I got to bring it now. I got to really deep down, dig deep and sing that song. Uh, uh, matter of fact, um, uh, Lakeside was singing in the background, you know, on uh, Cause I Love You, and, uh, you know, so that uh, was just an exciting, exciting time period in my life. The songwriting, too, is very important, too, because you hooked up with another, I think, another unsung and criminally underrated guitarist and blues singer by the name of Johnny Guitar Watson. Oh, yeah, I went Johnny. I was down in my earlier years. Uh, actually, before I joined Tom Power, I would go down to L.A. on the weekends down in Hollywood, and I uh, met Johnny Guitar Watson. We started writing, and uh, we wrote the song Don't Change Horses in the Middle of the Stream. I was actually working at uh, Ford Motor Company, and I would... Uh, I hated being there because I felt like I should be singing, and so it was a great job, though. And, um, and so I... Uh, hooked up with Johnny and I got hypnotized by the line and I started writing this song Don't Change Horses in the Middle of the Stream I told Johnny about it Johnny we got down there he revamped it and uh, we did the song with uh, Tower Power after I joined Tower Power became their second biggest uh, uh, single and so just really excited about that Johnny was, as a matter of fact I talked to his daughter today yes right Virginia yeah yeah Come on, y'all.
That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report reporting live here at the Lincoln Center Out of Doors series here in Lincoln Center here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the legendary Lenny Williams for his time, as well as the staff and management here at Lincoln Center. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. <laughs>